All right, welcome back, guys. We're sitting here with former Socceroo and former Essendon Royals player and senior coach, Michael Kasija. Welcome, welcome, Michael. Thanks, Matthew. Um, so let's let's just start by talking about your, your playing days at the Royals or your first stint at the Royals. Um, so I think it was 2004 when you first signed for the club. So can you just tell us a little bit about what actually brought you to the club in, in the first place? Uh, well... The season before I came, I was with South Melbourne in in what was the last uh, the mm. last season of the old National Soccer League NSL, mm. um, and then the A League was to be formed. But there was an eighteen month gap or so in between the two leagues, so all National League players uh, dropped down into their Premier Leagues, their state Premier Leagues, yeah. um, and played at least one season there uh, before the A League clubs and, and coaches and teams were formed. Um, so that's, that's why and how I ended up at Essendon Royals in, in 04. Yeah, so what was the original co- contact? Obviously, the club knew you were looking for a club or what was it about Royals? I guess there would have been a few clubs probably after you at the time. Uh, the two main reasons were David Clarkson was coach at Essendon Royals at the time um, and Clarky and I obviously played together at South Melbourne and won some championships together there. So, you know, we've got a really close friendship and, and bond. Um, and the other big factor was that Michael Catalano was the president of Essendon Royals at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I actually went to school with uh, the Catalano boys okay. um, and, and knew the family well. So, um, respected them highly. Um, so, they were the, the two reasons that, that I saw me come to the Royals. Yeah, and I guess that season there would have been quite a few high quality players playing in the Premier League with the NSL sort of A League gap at, at the time. What What are your memories of uh, of that season as a whole? Yeah, well, I remember at Royals we had again because of the David Clarkson connection, we had um, Paul Coveney, who we all know well at the Royals. Yeah, he was with that. Um, uh, Dean Anastasiadis was there. Steve Yosafidis was there. Um, uh, I remember Stephen. We had a young Stephen Pace there as well, yeah. um, and some other really good players. Um, but yeah, I mean the, the league was strong then. Um, coming from the national league, I, I didn't know too much about the, the state premier league. Yeah. Um, uh, but it was it, it wasn't a really high standard. Yeah, uh, the standard didn't seem to bother you too much. You bagged a few goals that year. I think it was seventeen from from sixteen games, uh, and you missed like the first five or six games as well. Um, why, why do you think the goals flew so so freely that that season? Well, I think obviously, you know, dropping down a level from National League to Premier League, um, you know, I'm going to dominate more in a, in, a, in a state Premier League rather than the National League. I had a really good year in South Melbourne in the yep. final year of, of the National League. Um, we made the prelim final. Um, I, I scored a lot of goals as well. Um, so personally, I was probably the, the fittest that that, and I was only. I was only maybe 25, 26 yeah. at the time. So I was still, you know, pretty much in the peak um, of my football. So yeah. um, hence why those two years at the SM Royals were, were really strong for me personally. Yeah. And I think it was your second game. You, you scored a hat-trick uh, at the Calabria Club. I mean, all, all the home games would have been at the Calabria Club back then. What, what was the Royals like at, at that time as a club? The Royals, my memory of the Royals back then were, um, again, because I knew the Catalana family well, um, mm. there's a really good bond. Um, the team had come up from the state leagues. They've been really su- successful coming up the leagues. Um, and that was their first time in the Premier League in a long time. Mm. Um, so that they, they had done really well as a club um, to get to that level. And obviously, um, you know, success like that don't, doesn't come um, with luck. Yeah. Um, reasons behind that um so they're they always a good family cl- club the players had a really good bond really good friendships um and that sort of held them in, in good stead getting them to the premier league yeah and then obviously uh you, you stuck around at the club in 2005 uh with the a-league starting i think that year as well was there any of the any uh, ever discussions with a-league clubs at that time or uh there were there were um Mainly with interstate ones. Yep. Um, and I'd only just come back from overseas. Um, mm-hmm. My son was just born uh, when we got back to Australia from overseas. Yeah. Um, and I just started a new business. So, you know, um, 
I wasn't really a, a young player looking to make make it in my career. I don't, I don't really, luckily, I don't really achieve a lot. Yeah. Um, and you know, in my mid twenties, it was just time I think to, to settle down and focus on the next part of, of my life with my family and work. And, yeah. Um, continue to really enjoy playing the game, but just at a Premier League level. Yeah. And and obviously a, a relatively successful year again. You know, five in terms of of goals scored. Uh, I think it was about a mid table finish for the club. Um, what was, what was, I guess, the difference between the 04 and the 05 season? Uh, we had a new coach in 05. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Clark, he left because he lived on the other side of town. So, it was really hard for him to get out to um, uh, Essendon and Pascaval sort of training, training area. Yeah. Um, we had Michael Michalakopoulos in my second year at Royals. Mm-hmm. And I remember Mickey well from my playing days at Heidelberg. Yeah. Um, I was just a a young youth player, 16, 17, 17 years old, just sort of started training with the senior team. And Michael's a, an established striker and a really good National League striker for Heidelberg at the time. Um, and always treated me well as a young player. Um, and similar when he came down as a coach, Mick was, Mick was great. Um, we, had a, we had a really good bond with the players. Um, but with the Royals at that stage, we were a really young team and probably just you know, bring a new and fresh team in the Premier League, um, just a step below um, what we needed to be in terms of achieving, you know, ultimate success or, you know, yeah. playing in finals and things like that. And the other thing in 05 as well was um, was the first time I met Mick Giacomi um, yeah. because he was Mikhail Coppola's assistant at the time. Um, and, you know, Mick had an instant rapport with the players back then as well. Um, and hence why 10 or so years later, he was my assistant when I was... A coach of the Royals. Yeah, and I mean, t- tell us a bit about. Obviously, after that season, you you went and played with some other uh, Premier League clubs, Altona, that sort of thing. Um, but you came back. I think it was in 2012. Was probably your first year back as as player coach. Um, yeah, what what sort of brought you back to the club at that at that stage? Obviously, a different stage of your career. Yeah, I I, I had um, retired playing earlier that year, or, or maybe a year ago. Um, my last club being Oakley in the Premier League yep. and um, I was early 30s but just mentally I, was, I knew it was time to give it away I started pre-season and then um, we had the break in January and I got back to pre-season at the start of January and I just I didn't want to be there anymore so I don't think mm. it wouldn't would have been fair on me or the, or the club and um, so we just shook hands and I walked away and that was it for what I thought would be my playing career um, <laughs> And immediately I got into coaching, you know, I wanted to be stay involved with the game, um, did my C licence straight away, um, had a, an unsuccessful stint at uh, another state league club, which only lasted six weeks. Yeah. But, you know, you know they say you've never been a coach until you get sacked, so that happened <laughs> pretty well in my coaching career. Um, and then fortunately, when I was doing my C licence, um, I met Lachlan Armstrong, who I've known previously. Yep. Yep. And he was the TD at Royals. Um, and that's how the initial introduction with, with Royals and, and the committee and the president started back then. Yeah. And I mean, how much, it must have been a, a bit weird coming back to the Royals after that long and seeing, I guess, how much the club had changed. Obviously, you know, we'd have to start from the bottom of the ladder again in terms of playing in the provisional leagues. Um, I think the season you came, what, what was state, state four? Yeah, State 4 or, you know, the Football Victoria changed the leagues and the structures. That many years. times. <laughs> Whether it was Provisional 1 or State 4, it was somewhere down, down the bottom anyway. Yeah. Um, I, remember, I remember meeting Rockman at a senior game the year before I started. He said, come down and see the boys. And um, I was at Columbia Club. Yeah. And I remember going to the game and, um, you know, to me it looked like it was a team of 15-year-olds out yeah. there. <laughs> Angry bloke in the midfield getting a, getting a red card, but that was David Minola, of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so they were a really young team. Um, and that day I met the, the, pre, the president, Morris Mutchell. Yeah. Um, and we just started conversations then about the following season, um, knowing that, that your dad at the time was, was not going to yep. continue coaching the next year. So they were obviously looking for someone to continue um, the great job that your dad did. Um, yep. Yeah. That's sort of how it all started there. Yeah, and, and what, was, uh, what was that like, I guess? Is, you sort of had a blank canvas to work with in a lot of ways. Was, it, was that good for you as a coach, I guess, to have that sort of blank slate to, to start fresh with? Yeah, it was. I mean, when, when I first started coaching um, 
at a senior level, uh, I would have been happy to be an assistant somewhere as well. Yeah. Um, if I could be an assistant under the right person um, and learn things, um, you know, that, that I needed to learn as a young coach. Um, but the other, the other way I could learn, obviously, would be on the job. And that's sort of how I saw it at Essendon Royals. It was a, it was a young team. Um, you know, there wasn't that immediate expectation of coming in and, and having and being successful. Um, it, was a, it was a senior team that had only just restarted two years before. Um, so it really was a blank canvas and an opportunity for me to improve my coaching, um, learn on the job, and, and hopefully grow with the, the players and the club and the team that I had. Yeah, it was an incredible stint, obviously, up to state one in the space of, uh, what, four, five years, I think, um, or six years. No, five years, wasn't it? Uh, five years to state one, correct. Yeah, so, um, I mean, what, was, what, were the, what were the initial challenges, I guess, you know, in terms of, of moving up the ranks? Uh, I suppose the, the initial challenges were um, <laughs> I, had never, I had never played or coached at that level. Yeah. Um, so, you know, player players mentality, um, which you know, which is really one of the greatest things that I enjoyed was um, going to training and, and young players just listening to everything you have to say mm. and and pretty much taking everything on board and just trying their best to to listen and implement what I was wanting of them. Yeah. Um, you know, it was from a, an amateur standard trying to not just improve the players in the team, but the, the whole club and, and yeah. the structure within the senior, um, the senior squad, um, trying to get it to a level where, uh, you know, I know it should be and needs to be to be successful. Yeah. And uh, there were obviously a heap of Essendon Royals juniors in those, those early teams and, and a number of them probably stuck with you for, for quite a few years as, as we moved up the ranks. Um, how important was having that, I guess, that core to that squad of, of guys who had played at the club as, as juniors? It was it was massive. It was massive. Um, you know, one of the uh, one of the things that drew me to Essen Royals um, as a coach was that I knew it had a massive junior yeah. base. Um, was always a su- successful junior club. Mm. Um, the senior team was full of of juniors of, of Essen Royals juniors. Um, so for me, you know, as well as just being a senior coach, I think it's extremely important to you know for me to immerse myself in the culture of the club and get to know the way the juniors are structured and the way the juniors operate and the junior players that are there. Um, because it's not just one team. I think, you know, as a senior coach, you are the, the head of the club and it's important for um, other things to function up I, under that. Otherwise, you know, you, you won't be successful as, as a senior team. Yeah. And obviously, you know, over that period, the, the, uh, the size of the junior arm of the club has grown almost exponentially. What, what do you think the, the reason is for, you know, the club being such a hit in terms of uh, the, junior, the junior side of things? Look, I think, you know, and again, that, that's why I came back to the club um, because it's so, it's so well run. It's such mm-hmm. great people. Yeah. Um, you know, in my seven years, yes, it's had its ups and downs. Um, you know, but, you know, the committee we've got at the moment are fantastic. Some of the other committees that I've worked with have been brilliant. Um, at just such a well-run professional club, especially for the standard that it, that it was. Um, yep. I'm talking state three and state four. <laughs> there are always great people involved, always willing people willing to help out, um, always people just putting their heart and soul into the club and trying to do the right thing. Um, and obviously playing at so many clubs, I, I know that's a rare thing in, in soccer in Australia, unfortunately, mm. is just you know dealing with good people every day and, you know, I'm lucky enough to say that after seven years, you know, a lot of those people have become lifelong friends now. Mm. Um, and even the fact that, you know, I, I left the senior coach and, and then still to come back to SN Royals as, as you know, the, the junior TD now, um, I suppose just shows the respect that I have for the club and the club has for me. Mm. Um, and again, that, that's, that's pretty rare uh, to happen in, in, you know, football in Australia. Mm. Um, and, and, and I mean, still staying on your coaching days, what, I mean, what was the major highlight? Obviously, probably winning, winning State 3 is probably the, the standout uh, from that time. Was, was, that, was that your, your favourite season, if you had to pick one? Uh, probably winning State 2 was better. Yeah. Um, because 
the, the year before, or not, not winning, getting promoted from state two, sorry. Um, yeah, the year before we got promoted from state two, we actually missed out on promotion by one point. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which is always difficult because you've got to go through that whole, you know, pre-season, season again, um, 26 rounds or 22 rounds and, and to get that achievement. Um, so it becomes a really long 12 months, 12 month process. Um, but fortunately enough, we, we, we could do it. Um, yeah, so that was probably um, the greatest achievement, I think, as a coach at Royals. Yeah. Uh, any, any standout players from, from your time as coach? I know, I know it's always a bit rude to ask a coach to single out players, but uh, anyone that stood out? Oh, look, there's, there's been a lot um, because we've gone from, from um, State 4 to State 1. Um, there's been so many players that have played a big part at, at different levels. Mm. Um, you know, early on, it was fantastic to have so many Royals players at the club, just give their... They might not have been technically as good as some of the others that I've, that I've coached in the last couple of years, but they just they gave their heart and soul and everything they had for the club um, and just really played for the, for the badge. Um, you know, if I, if I was to single out players, I mean, when we got promoted from State 2, we had um, the two players that would have stood out would be Ryan McAvoy, yep. um, came from Ireland, First Division Ireland, and um, Luca Simeone as well. Um, who came from Serie B in Italy. Um, and those, those two guys were just massive for us. Um, and probably a standout of the, as the two best players that, that have played under me. Yeah. Um, any, any other sort of funny moments from, that you can think of from, the, from your Royals career there as a player or a, as a coach? Um, oh, look, we've, we've, you know, we've had some, some great times, some sad times. Um, I think probably anyone that knows the Royals team manager, Atze Bogowski, um, would, would say that every day with him is, is a funny moment. Um, funny moment, pull your hair out moment, uh, an everything moment. Um, but that's, that's what I love to have in the change rooms. You, know, you need someone to, to lighten the mood and, and have a laugh with the players and the coaching staff. And, um, you know, I think from when we got promoted, um, from State 2, we had myself, Mick Giacomi, Enzo Inglesi was the reserve coach, and we had Atze. Um, and, and we would just be in a laugh at every training session. You know, we just had a, an unbelievable bond as a, as a foursome um, and just had a great time. And, and yeah, probably Atze was the centre of, of most of our laughs. Yeah, yeah, I, I believe that. Uh, and, and, and tell me a bit about the relationship with Mick. Obviously, uh, you know, your assistant coach for a while there. and someone who just bleeds Essendon Royals or Trieste as they were when he played for them. Um, how important was that having someone with, you know, that sort of deep connection to the club uh, on the sidelines with you? Yeah, again, it was, it was really, really big, you know. Um, I think Mick came in, became involved in my third year of coaching um, and stayed with me until the end. Um, you know, uh, because the level, again, the level we were at, uh, it was really important to instill a, a different level of professionalism into the players um, to achieve what we wanted to achieve. But um, I, I don't think you can substitute that heart and soul person um, as an assistant coach that Mick brought to the group. So although we increased the professionalism, we still wanted the, the culture and the team to have uh, Essendon Royals blood still throwing, you know, flowing through it um, and Mick definitely brought that, you know. Um, he made sure every player that came into the squad or into the team, as we did change so many um, players over the years, obviously. Um, but he made sure that they really knew and understood what playing for us in the Royals meant. Yeah. And uh, if we talk, I guess, more generally about your career, obviously you had an amazing career um, before you arrived at the Royals in, in 2004. Um, what are some of your, your best memories from the old NSL days? Obviously, you know, some amazing seasons with, with South. What are your memories of, I guess, NSL football for maybe those younger viewers who, uh, who weren't around to see the NSL? You know, look, my whole National League career was just playing for South Melbourne for, yeah. I believe, six seasons. Um, five before I went overseas and then obviously the last season of the National League when I returned back from overseas. Um, and 
again, I, I, was, I was very fortunate. Um, I came to South Melbourne straight out of the AIS um, mm-hmm. with Frank Arrock as coach and, and Ange Postacoglu as his assistant. Um, we had a really raw first season. I was still playing in the youth team at that stage. I think I was just turned 18. Um, made my debut as an 18-year-old and then Ange took over from Frank in that first season. Mm-hmm. Um, and pretty much when Ange started playing me off the bench, I, I was scoring... I started scoring a bit and obviously, you know, you keep scoring and, and you get more opportunities. Yeah. Um, but the highlight of that time was obviously our back-to-back championship um, with South Melbourne. Um, fantastic playing group, fantastic coaching group. Um, and that culminated, obviously, in the, in the Club World Cup where we went to, uh, to Brazil to play against Vasco da Gama and, and Manchester United, one of your favourite teams, Matt. <laughs> well, you're a Liverpool fan, so I'm sure you would have enjoyed the uh, chance to kick a few United players. Yeah, well, uh, they kicked some goals against us, so yeah. it didn't really work. <laughs> yeah. uh, but we had a great time there. We had, you know, it, was a, it was a great time. And had to play against Vasco da Gama, who had Romario yeah. and Ed Woodward at the time. You know, in, at the Maracanã in front of 60,000 people. It was, um, yeah, amazing, amazing. Was that the highlight of, of your South Korea or, or was it the championships that got you there? Uh, uh, I'd, I'd say the championships. Yeah. Yeah. At- the, the Brazil trip was probably more enjoyable, but no, I think nothing beats the achievement um, and effort that goes into winning a championship. Yeah, and uh, tell me a bit about like Ange as a coach. Obviously, you you worked with Ange at the very early stages, I guess, of his his coaching career. Um, and you know, he's he's a guy who doesn't uh, hold back when it comes to you know sticking to a certain way of playing the game. And he's obviously gone on to achieve amazing things with the Socceroos with obviously in, in Japan and Yokohama. Um, was that, I guess, that philosophy that he had, was that evident from like day dot when, when he took over as coach? Well, probably not, um, because he came in, into coaching South Melbourne at such a young age. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember how old he was, but he must have been early, early 30s back then um, when he started at South Melbourne. Um, but I, I suppose the, the thing I took away from Ange um, was his, his man management um, was fantastic right from the start. Um, you know, we had, a, we had a really good young playing group at the time, um, but he, the way he gelled everything together and brought us all together and dealt with us as, as individuals and as a group, um, you could see from, from even the early stages um, that he was going to have a big career as a coach. Yeah, and... Um... Any other any other standout seasons from from that time at South? Uh, look, I mean, the first season that Ange took over was um, we lost in the prelim to Sydney United, um, and I remember sitting in the chain room as a nineteen year old young player, um, and we had some we had probably five or six young boys um, back then, along with some some great experienced players like Paul Trimboli and. Um, Fausto Diamichis, for example, and David Clarkson. Um, but I remember sitting in the chain rooms after that prelim loss and uh, quite a few of us were in tears, obviously. You know, it's, it's a tough way to go out the week before the grand final. And I remember Ange saying, um, you know, that feeling that you have now, as bad as it, uh, as bad as it feels and as bad as, bad as, it, as it is, um, let that drive you through the whole of the next season. Um, and we took that on board and, and that's when we started for our back-to-back championships from then. Yeah. And, and, and talk to me a bit about um, your moves overseas. So I think it was Partizan that you, you went to first. Um, how did that all sort of eventuate? Um, Partizan happened, I was playing in the Olympic squad, the Oliru squad at the time. Yeah. Um, so just through contacts and, and managers and, and things like that, um, you know, my family's Serbian background. Um, I have cousins over there. Um, you know, it's, it's a big breeding club um, or stepping stone club for, for players to go to Europe, um, other leagues in Europe. So at the time, I thought it'd be a, a good move um, as a first step out of Australia because I, I do know the culture a little bit and, and obviously the language and, and things like that. Yeah. And uh, it was one season there and then off to Braga in, in Portugal. So, um what was that experience like? You know, I mean, what was the culture like in Portugal as opposed to uh, Serbia? Um, 
probably different, obviously different in Portugal. Um, I found Portugal probably a little bit more um, old school, um, possibly because one our, our coach was um, really old school and probably someone in his late 60s um, yeah. who, who spoke no English and, and was a real character of a person, similar to like a Frank Arrock was as a coach. Okay, um, yeah. But the club at that stage had a really old stadium in Portugal, um, and a lot of them were. Um, so as a setup and things, Partizan was a lot was a lot more modern and, and probably ahead at that time. Um, and Braga, although a big club, um, uh, was struggling a little bit at that, at that stage. So I was still sort of trying to find its feet in the league. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned before, obviously, you know, the, the Olympics, uh, the Oli Roos and... Um, Having, having gone to South through the AIS, uh, and that's probably a topic that's been in the news lately following the uh, Mark Duker interview we were talking about um, before and some of the comments that were made by people at the FFA about that. Um, what, what role did the AIS play in, in your personal development and, and what did you take out of that program? Um, probably, apart from Ange, as, as a coach, um, the person who most had an impact on, on me as a coach was Ron Smith at the AIS. Um, you know, going there as a 17-year-old, um, you know, it's really that, that last step before becoming um, what you hope to be a, a professional career. Um, and, and the setup was amazing at the AIS. I mean, we had, um, in, in the group that I was there and probably the one after me, there was, um, you know, myself, Lucas Neal, Hayden Fox, Josip Simonich, um, Brett Emerton, Vince Grella, Simon Colosimo, Marco Bresciano, um, just goes on and on. You know, Mark Viduka was there a um, little mm. bit before me, Josip Skoko, um, just great, great players. You know, I was just churning out great players every, every year, um, which, you know, they say, why did we have the, the golden generation? Well, you know, the AIS played a really big part, I believe, in, in, in that. Yeah, and I mean, you, obviously, I've spoken to some other players who have been coached by Ron, and they all speak like you, you know, about how important he was in in their development. But what what was it about him specifically as a coach that seemed to turn probably good players into players that were good enough into to have a professional career? Um, he he, I don't think I've met anyone that loves coaching as much as Ron. Mm. Um, I still follow him on Twitter, and he's still. He still assesses everything in the game and, and you know, he writes dossiers and, and does PhDs on soccer <laughs> and football and the rules and, and the goals in World Cups. And um, he, he's just a, a real soccer nut, you know. And um, he, he just needed, he knew what every player needed to take that next step, basically. Um, so for me, for example, he knew... Uh, my strength was always finishing and goal scoring. So he really worked with me one-on-one and individually um, into improving that, you know, whether it be positioning, the runs you make, um, the way you hit a ball. Um, just, yeah, he really worked individually with, with each and every player into making them into better players. Yeah. So AIS sessions were, obviously you did stuff as a team and then you'd have a set amount of time to work as an individual with Ron or how, how would that sort of work? It wasn't, um, it wasn't really structured in terms of the individual work. Mm-hmm. That would be, um, Michael, I'll meet you tomorrow morning at the indoor, at the indoor um, centre and, and we'll do some, some shooting drills. Or we'll get Michael and um, Brett Emerton to go do some shooting and crossing or we'll have a, a group of the strikers and, and in this morning and we'll do, you know, heading at goals or things like that. So mm-hmm. um, the individual stuff wasn't um, as structured as the team stuff. It was basically he would, he would pull people out when and if he thought they could improve something and, and just work on it from there. But the, the big thing about Ron, and um, I hear him mention it all the time now, and, and it's a really big thing in, in modern coaching, um, you know, if you do the if you do your licenses, for example, that the training session should replicate the game. Mm-hmm. Um, so every drill you should, you know, every drill you do at training should replicate something that you are trying to improve from a player or an area of that team that that needs to be worked on. Um, and he did that, and then 
but I think the the hard thing about that is to make it is to make it simple for players mm. because players don't like complexity. Um, <laughs> uh, players don't listen for more than 10, 20 seconds. Um, so Ryan just had a really almost almost as as a school teacher would a good school teacher had a really good way of of, of teaching that into the players so they could understand it and 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 implement it. Yeah. And, and I guess, uh, to go back even further, what, what are your sort of earliest memories of, of football? Um, as, a, as a junior a junior player, I remember growing up playing with um, Rosanna Soccer Club. With, um, I remember we used to score five or six goals every week up front. Um, so that's probably my first um, memory of, of, of playing soccer as a junior. And then I had... Um, some really good junior clubs at Berlin and, and Heidelberg. Um, we had some really good teams back in the old Super League days. Um, you know, and, and then graduating to the youth leagues. Um, they were really, really strong youth leagues um, back then. Um, a lot of those players went on to have great careers and then some are played with it at, at the highest level again. Yeah. And uh, what, what about these days, mate? Obviously, you're still very obsessed with, with football. We've, we've put your movies, your favourite... Uh, football movies and TV shows up today. So uh, how, how big is the obsession with football these days? Obviously something you still enjoy reading, watching, uh, talking about. Well, it's probably bigger these days, Matt, because we've got nothing else to bloody do. So <laughs> you know, all we can do is read a book or, or you know, jump on Twitter and then look up football things or listen to a podcast or um, you know, chuck on a Netflix documentary. So um, I suppose if... if anything good can come out of this terrible situation that everyone's in is that, um, you know, we can probably improve, improve on things that we enjoy. So for me, it's really, you know, coaching and, and we're not out in the park, but it gives myself an opportunity to, to do some research, to, to, you know, jump online and do things that, um, you know, you find it hard to find the time to do. Mm. Well, Michael, thanks so much for your time. Um, it was really great to, to chat and I guess learn a bit more about you as a, a footballer, as a coach and, and as a person. No worries, man. Thank you, mate.